And you're setting us up perfectly for the next piece of our conversation, which is the electric grid. And I guess what you're getting at there is also like, well, if the grid's not ready to handle the charging, there's not enough chargers, then maybe this system of swapping could be a lot more efficient. Um, and I guess this is, you know, shout out to Viv, my friend who commented on when I was asking about questions about this episode, you know, her point was like, how are we talking about electric vehicles in India if the grid's not reliable? And they have, you know, her point was they were rate, I think 80 out of 137 countries in terms of grid reliability. You've mentioned to me in our conversations that, you know, you've been experienced frequent blackouts when you go visit there. Um, so I'm curious, you know, if, if we're gonna be running around electric vehicles, we need to be able to charge them all up and we need to do it with clean energy. And it seems like as much as that's also a problem in the US and Europe, it's really even much more of a problem in India of getting the grid to that level to where it can handle mass adoption of EVs. Um, and that's like a whole nother piece of the issue. So I'm really excited to dive into this piece because I think this is probably the biggest barrier for EV adoption in India. If you look at slide 13, what you say is very, very true about grid reliability having been an issue previously. So a decade ago, the deficit of supply versus demand for electricity was double digit percentage. And now that number has been slowly coming down over time. I mean, I will give the Indian government and players in the Indian energy markets credit that, and these are statistics directly from the Ministry of Power in India, that the deficit has been reducing over time. However, a deficit still does exist and reliability of the grid itself is still complicated. The solution around that has been the uptake of more renewables and more behind the meter. So if we look at slide 11, what we see is, you know, on the left-hand side, because of COVID, total electricity generation fell in April 2019. What was the only category that grew? Renewables. Wow, so, so this is already happening. Falling, it's already happening and it's been happening for a long time. Now, if you were to look over it on a comparable year-per-year -year basis, which you see on the right-hand side, it's, it, it's a tough story because over the span of a year, you know, COVID had such a severe impact that the right-hand side is the only story that's now being reported in the mainstream media. But I think the left-hand side is even more important, which is that not even a pandemic could stop the fact that Indian companies, Indian consumers, the Indian government prefers a renewable-led growth. Much of the conversation around climate change when it comes to countries and climate change always poses the question of, well, how can we institute the parent climate, the Paris Climate Accords if you have billions of people in China and India aspiring to the quality of life that we have here in the Western world? And I think that they're not mutually exclusive arguments. You can give people in India, people in China, the quality of life that Western countries do have over time without sacrificing the energy grid, without dumping the atmosphere with a lot of carbon. And as we see over here on the left-hand side of this page, India has made a choice to go with renewables. I hope this trend continues. It's pretty crazy to see that that, that it's more than 10% of the energy generated was from renewable sources in April. Like that's pretty awesome. Yeah, absolutely. And this has been a trend that's been a long time coming. So over, over here on slide 12, we see each of these circles on this page is a major utility scale solar generation deployment over the last decade, right? And I mean, we see some of these big projects like the, the Bedla Solar Park in Rajasthan, 2,200 peak power megawatts. I mean, that is a serious commitment for a project right there. So the government has been very strong in deploying solar, but it's not just going to take the government. What we see in India over here on slide 14 is if you were to segment the market for expansion of clean energies, including battery storage, right? This is how I would kind of quickly define them. Government, like we said, has been going out and doing tenders and has been instituting these new projects. Rural areas in India are still the areas that are hardest hit when it comes to electricity reliability, access to grid infrastructure, just access to infrastructure in general. And that's a problem that is mostly being solved by the government because the business opportunity is hard to come by for somebody who's trying to build a build a large grid out there. The solution out there is something more like off-grid solar, community solar, behind the meter generation, individual solar power plants um, that we've seen throughout the developing world. Your non-rural consumers 
what are they using solar? What are they using renewables for? Well, if they don't get renewable electricity directly from the grid, they're usually using it as their backup power sources. So in our family home when I was growing up, whenever the power would trip off because we'd have a blackout, we'd have a diesel generator that immediately kicked in. And this is something that a lot of middle-class families in India have adopted over time is a backup power source. For the first time, there's more solar being installed as backup capacity than diesel in India. Wow. So even in my, like even in my family home in India, now if the power goes off, what trips on is a solar and a battery. That's so And this cool. in my mind is the big opportunity for a company like Tesla is the deployment of power walls and power packs to help families, to help businesses go behind the meter to ensure that power reliability. The point you bring up is really interesting that this is happening already because I think that signals a key sort of, maybe it's consumers willing to pay a slight premium, but also just in general, the cost of implementing these solar and battery solutions is actually getting to the point where it's almost competitive with diesel and maybe operating it, it's a faster uptime, it's easier, it's cleaner, so people are actually going with it. Like to me, that's so exciting that that's already happening. And then I think about you know the solar roof opportunity um, with those power walls and like, that kind of combination to be a microgrid or behind the meter solution for a lot of like people in India, you know, I just think this is so like, the more and more I've thought about the solar roof and just how energy hits every single building and we're never collecting it is just such a waste. And especially in India where it's like hot and you have a lot of sun, um, like there's probably so many rooftops that are just not generating energy. And now it's just about building this infrastructure one by one. And it's almost like an amazing gift that all this te new green technology is ready so they can rebuild from scratch without this legacy infrastructure to fossil fuels and all that kind of stuff. One more difficulty when it comes to the uptake of technology like solar in India, and this goes to the last two categories on this page of non-rural consumers and CNI. So here in the United States, if you wanted to go out and finance a construction project on your house, like solar, you would qualify for financing by the fact that you have a credit history and then you have a FICO score. FICO scores and credit histories don't exist in India at the same level in which they're here in the Western world. And so that's why if solar deployers are not working for a government, they're usually going after the commercial and industrial sector. So throughout India, there's you know large industrial parks where businesses from all over the world, Indian or otherwise, are operating in conjunction. And there's just greater peace of mind when you're a solar deployer to know that a CNI client is going to pay their bills as compared to an individual consumer who doesn't have a FICO score or an equivalent. So the power pack opportunity is massive for that reason. Yeah. And it's pretty cool because this is maybe the first example I could ever think of where Tesla it makes more sense for them to build a gigafactory for power walls and behind the meter storage and grid scale batteries and the solar roof versus vehicles. Like that's the real opportunity in India first. And then as you fix these sort of energy supply chain issues, then that will sort of naturally open up the market for electric vehicles. And so it seems like it's almost a reverse where like China, Tesla's going first for vehicles in India, it would make a lot of sense for Tesla to go first for grid and energy. Um, and I see that as the huge opportunity of like, should, if Tesla was going to do an Indian Gigafactory today, what would they do immediately start building grid batteries and solar roofs, um, as opposed to, to cars, um, which I think back is in like... 2015, back in 2015, Narendra Modi, who is the prime minister of India, visited the Tesla factory. And that's what he said. He said, I'm here because I think battery storage can help our grid. So this has been an ongoing conversation. Now, I don't know about if Tesla has any plans with India. I would love to hear them talk about it on a on an earnings call or at the AGM or maybe even at Battery Investor Day. But I'm willing to bet that since that conversation between Narendra Modi and Elon in 2015, that this has at least been a coal in the fire within the company. And I hope it happens in the future. Yeah, and Elon did say, because they opened up Model 3 reservations for India, and he did recently say to a customer on Twitter that they would soon have an announcement about entering the Indian market because at this point, you know, I, at my guess is I think they thought they would already be selling some cars into India by now, but have hit some regulations. And I recall Elon saying at a shareholder meeting that it was a lot due to governments, like just sort of friction with the government of import taxes, not enough built in India. And that sort of headache is why they hadn't entered it yet. So I don't know. I'm sort of curious, really, really curious because I'm like, Tesla's got the technology, India needs it. Like, 
is there going to be a shoot a drop here? Huge potential, but maybe it, I could also see it never happening. And if it doesn't happen, by the way, like, yeah, I love Tesla. I'm a former employee of the company. This space is much bigger than just one company. Totally. There's there's a lot of good work being done by startups in India, by the incumbents in India. And they will continue to do that work for India, regardless of if Tesla enters or not. 